<laughs> Life's full of tough choices, isn't it? <laughs> Will the owner of a red and black land speeder vehicle ID THX1138 please return to your craft? You are parked in a no hover area. <laughs> Attention, please. Board W, w Radio. Your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 663, and together we're gonna celebrate the magic of the Disney parks, movies, and more. Here on the podcast, my weekly live video on Facebook, community, blog, and more, please be sure to subscribe to the podcast and find everything else at www.radio.com. So in part two of our 2021 Disney Year in Review, this week we're going to look at some of the most important happenings in the movies and on Disney+, Plus, including releases from Disney, Marvel, and Star Wars, before looking at some important company-wide news and events and then a lightning round of questions that you can answer as well. I'll have our Disney trivia question of the week and more updates at the end of the show. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. Really relevant. All right, so let's. I think we should move from the parks to the screens. Let's start small and work our way up to big. I'm thinking of you, Disney Plus, and I don't know what, if anything, you have specifically on Disney Plus in terms of something that was important, um, a, a ranking of some of the Disney Plus shows, your favorite Disney Plus shows. So just sort of quickly go around the the table. And give me your thoughts in terms of the impact and importance, whether individually or collectively, of Disney Plus in 2021. Becky? I had the most fun ever with WandaVision. And it was completely from the moment we were sitting there and it was announced in front of us and we saw where it was uh, Destination D, I think it was, or was, yeah, I think it was. And watching the preview to the teaser to kind of, kind of tell us what was coming. And I sat there and I went, what, <laughs> what is this? And what is it going to possibly be? And I don't understand how these characters are going to get into the fifties and it makes no sense. So when it finally came out and little by little episode by episode, we got those little tastes of what they were, the, the journey and the story that they were leading us down for the path. Um, turned into, okay, now I see what they're trying to do, but Mephisto is definitely the big bad, you know, all of the discussions that it caused us to have, um, being in the spoilers group, every single time there was an episode, we would all jump right back in and go, okay, this is what I think is happening. And then you would compare ideas and compare notes. I have never had a, a, a series or even a movie that made such a community around it in all of the guessing games we had and all the fun trying to figure out what was going on. Um, that really was much more of an experience than just watching a show. Wanda, it is not hyperbole when I say that WandaVision was groundbreaking television. Um, yeah. Becky, I had the same, still have the same feeling. I have not felt the same way about a TV show, of which admittedly I don't watch a lot, since Lost where we are able to have these now virtual water cooler conversations. The show ends, we go back and like Lost, I think I need to watch that again. And then we go online, we go to our community and we talk about 
what we saw, what we didn't see, the Easter eggs we go back and we look for. I think it was such smart storytelling. It paid fan service to the hardcore comic book nerds who read the stories of Wanda and the House of M and all those other things, as well as people whose introduction to the Marvel Universe came through the cinematic universe and were introduced Mm -hmm. to those relatively obscure characters through that way who were now able to not only carry their own show, but introduced us to one of the most interesting villains that we've ever seen, right? What, wait, <laughs> what other Marvel show do you walk around singing the theme song in your head? Because now you are. That was brilliant. Like, I think it just, I think WandaVision, and it, it's far and away my number one on of Disney+. Plus. I think WandaVision hit on all cylinders and really um, from a design, storytelling, superhero, music, like Mephisto confirmed, what, hexagons, ever, I see hexagons everywhere I go now. <laughs> it, it, um, yeah. it is. I, I thought it was remarkable TV. It was incredibly cool. And I, I, I'm hoping that we get a season two. I hope we get some magic off of this because I want to feel that again. I want to feel that community bonding over a show again. I don't know why. I just do. <laughs> I need yeah, Mephisto I'm, to be well, a, no, the bad Agatha guy. Agatha gets her own spinoff show. Like I know. Chachi from Happy Days. So. <laughs> Good point. That might not be the best analogy, but you, you know. Connor, Lisa, any thoughts on either WandaVision itself or any of the other shows, MCU related or otherwise on Disney Plus? Yeah, I mean, I'll just punctuate that conversation with like, what a year for Marvel and Disney Plus, Mm -hmm. like WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, Hawkeye and What If all came this year. Like, that's insane. It's absolutely amazing. All that being said, I'm not even going to pretend I have a different one than Becky. I mean, WandaVision changed my experience of Marvel. You know, I always say like great media, like great cinema makes you want to know more. And I like I am now like subscribed to the Marvel Unlimited app. Like I was reading the comic. I was more into it than I've like it just it, it allowed me to enjoy it on a totally different level. And I think it also was this very cool education and like the potential of traditional consumption of television in an age of social media. Like, can you imagine like if when Lost was coming out, if we had social media the way we have it today? I mean, that was this was like a taste of that, that like water cooler. We had discussion forums that we would go to. Kids, you can I just feel like this, like this, obviously, like the sweeping nature of social media today. Just I I don't know. It just I just felt like we were having this very cool, very new sort of like Becky was saying, like community oriented cinematic experience and i think it's very much by design i think it is absolutely intentional in the way that they release things and they tease things and Mm -hmm. there's quote unquote leaks that come out Mm -hmm. i think it's brilliant just from a a pr perspective how they are able to sort of feed that interest and fuel that fire to not just go it's midnight i need to go watch tv because wandavision's coming out um but to say, I need to know more. Uh, Lisa, I think it, you saying that you went down the nerd rabbit hole of, I'm going to, I need to read the comics. I need to learn more about this is this, this wonderful secondary tertiary benefits that Disney gets, we get as fans to these characters and these universes that we get introduced to. Yeah, I mean, it almost felt like rediscovering something to the the level of like Harry Potter. It's like, oh, my gosh, there's this whole world that exists that I can immerse myself in and learn about. And there's really no end to it. And I mean, Marvel is that tenfold, obviously. Um, Yeah, more than nerded out. And I and I still am. I mean, I'm subscribed to YouTube channels that have nothing to do with the TV end of things, like just people who talk about the comics and will tell the stories while I'm doing other things. I can listen to them. Like I said, it just it completely changed the way that I consume you know, comics. Connor? I also think, I mean, 
Loki, I think, did a lot of that in, in a similar sort of vein. Very, very interesting. No idea where it's going to kind of go next. But, you know, in the NBA, they have an award called the Comeback Player of the Year. And basically how this award works is maybe there is a player who has been on kind of a downslope, you know, hasn't had a number of great seasons. And then all of a sudden reemerges, you know, averages a double-double, takes the league by storm and gets the Comeback Player of the Year award. Clint Barton. Hawkeye, let's give him the comeback player of the year award right there. I don't think anyone saw that coming, but I really enjoyed Hawkeye. I think um, it's cool. We'll see where it goes from there. I think Haley Steinfeld is a national treasure, and um, (laughs) I just really enjoyed that as well. I think it was pleasantly surprised. I think most people were pleasantly surprised with that as well. I really liked Loki. Quickly rank for me, Becky Lisa Connor, rank for me. (sighs) I'm always first. Marvel shows on Disney Plus from top to bottom. WandaVision, What If, Loki, Hawkeye, Falcon, and Winter Soldier. Same for me, but I think I'd probably flip Loki and What If. Mine's very different. Mine's Loki, um, probably Hawkeye. WandaVision. Wow. Who is this guy? Falcon and the Winter Soldier. <laughs> what if? I just couldn't get into what if. Oh, my gosh. And that was the thing <laughs> last sorry, year. We, you know what, that Connor's, was the one. Connor's uh, network connection just dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'll explain. I'll explain. I'll explain, my, I'll explain. I don't know if I did. Maybe I did. Who knows? My mind's like Rain Man over here. I just counted a bunch of matchsticks before this. But I'll explain my reasoning for it. Um, I just felt with WandaVision, we had, we were leading, so much was leading up and it was anticipation, anticipation, anticipation. We figure it out. And then like, you know, Agatha gets defeated in like 10 seconds. I was like, wow, that's a little anticlimactic. I felt hurt by it. But that being said, I don't know. I think for me, I enjoyed uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I think more than other people, because I see where it's going. Like I see the importance of it not in the series that it was, but what it means for the rest of the the cinematic universe going forward. With those other ones, they were kind of more a, a shot in time, I think. Um, but I think that Falcon and Winter Soldier, it, it's going to be more important going forward um, than it was probably in in the time that it was developed. What if was like, well, that's just me sitting around my house every day of my life. Oh, what if, you know, this did, this person did this instead of this, you know? So that's why I couldn't get into it necessarily. I get the appeal of it for sure. Um, I'll also say, you know, Elaine Bennis makes her way into the MCU. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big deal for me. <laughs> I hope she does the dance. God, I hope she yeah, does the dance. Yeah, God, it has to, yeah. <laughs> what if was the one that I was looking forward to most when we talked mm-hmm. about this at the end of last year? Because I wanted to see those reimagined nations. I wanted to see the the multiverse kind of come and splinter and and poke their their fingers in the eye of these different stories to see how it could have ended up. So I loved that series. I, I think it really and I did kind of struggle. At least I was with you, kind of going Loki to what if, but I I loved Loki. I really did. But I think what if just gave me that little extra. But what if, <laughs> which I loved. WandaVision being number one is all that really. Yeah, is. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can sort of interchange the others. I I, lo- I also loved what if. Um, I think mm-hmm. not since Into the Spider-Verse have I seen animation on screen that made me feel like I was watching a comic book the way mm-hmm. what if did. Yeah. And I think that's, I, I think that's a, a huge credit to the animators and the storytellers to make that happen. I I read what if comics as a kid, you know, what if Spider-Man joined the fantastic four? What if all these unbelievable things happening, seeing Spider-Man with Dr. Strange's cloak. And I I don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen it yet, but some of the other things that were both interesting, funny and, or setting up things that we may see in the Marvel cinematic universe going forward, I think made it for, um, an interesting and entertaining show like all of them. There were peaks and, and valleys, some deeper than others in, in some of the 
different episodes. Like, I don't think every single episode of Loki was perfect, but the ones that were good were really, really good. And regarding Falcon and Winter Soldier, there were while there were a lot of things I did not necessarily love about that, and I think a lot of us put that relatively low on our list, I, I think credit needs to be given where it is earned. And the credit I give is to Wyatt Russell for making us hate that character <laughs> so much. Like, he was yeah. instantly hated. The poor guy, like, you feel bad because you know because the internet is stupid it bleeds over to the poor guy's personal life and when you start getting you know um personal attacks on you because of the character that you played as awful and as hurtful as it are i think it, it's a testament to how well he played that character and i think one thing that falcon and winter soldier did was it showed us a very very different and very dark side of marvel which i understand turned some people off but i think is also going to be the first step towards opening doors to some other, some darker stories. That that scene where he is standing over him with that shield, you know how it ends, is a very, very, probably the darkest moment in Marvel. And I think a lot of people were, were very surprised by that. And it was a very bold move on Marvel's part to do that, especially not in a theatrical setting, but in a, in a TV Um, in a TV show setting. But I I think Wyatt Russell deserves credit for the performance that he gave. Uh, I think it's also important to mention uh, on Disney Plus, there were two other things that that came to mind uh, for different reasons. One, for, for, now we obviously know, you know, Mandalorian was a carryover from from a previous season, um, second season, third season, as, as good as. I think Star Wars Visions was, something interesting for Star Wars fans. It introduced a number of different in, uh, non-connected stories from different animators and artists using a different, uh, a variety of different sort of anime and, and manga styles. It definitely was not for everybody, but I think some of them just purely from a a um, an aesthetic, the, the first one that was in black and white, I thought was a beautiful story, wonderfully animated but the other show that i think absolutely bears mentioning i loved 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 behind the attraction um so i was gonna mention that yeah yeah, i thought behind the attraction unlike the imagineering story took a very light-hearted fun not so serious and in times kudos to you disney self-deprecating look at the history of individual attractions um the the producer brian volk weiss i who did um uh, the, the the toys that made us and the movies that made us. The movies um, that made us, yeah. Yeah, on I Netflix. love the way, sort of the, the fast-paced, which is what sort of the world we live in now, which I think why it was it was interesting to put this in, put, put that type of storytelling framework into this type of a show. And as somebody who, you know, I, I, I love Disney history and I love it. I learned so much. And I saw so much that I have never seen before because the people who were there that they leaned into for the stories and the information were not all from Disney. Um, they were independent authors, other podcasters, guys that I've known from over the years. I loved being able to see on screen as well as people that we know um, from Imagineering and, and from the parks, both legendary figures and, and some from the, the later generation helping to share the stories behind the stories. I think for a parks fan, I want more of this stuff. I mean, when it, when Disney plus launched, we had obviously the Imagineering story. And I think that was incredibly well done. We've gotten other little things here or there, but I need more parks content Mm -hmm. on that thing. So I think that behind the attraction was awesome. Um, Another one I really enjoyed as well was um, I just want to make sure I get the name right adventures through the walt disney archives which was a documentary done in 2020 for d23 gold members but made its 2021 debut on disney plus um i like all those sort of documentary style things and if we can continue to get it on disney plus and more about the parks and the attractions as well i mean 
I will, I will be a very happy camper. Please bring back Prop Culture season two. Also, yeah. by the way, which I was a 2020 thing, but I hope that comes back. Um, if nothing else from Disney Plus, let's move from the small screen to the big screen and everything in the Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, Animation Studios, Pixar Studios, anything under the Disney umbrella. What stood out to you, Becky, Lisa, and Connor? Shouldn't you just go first? No. <laughs> Well, we all we all know better than to to go that direction. So I'll I'll just you know move on into you know what the the tooth that stood out to me um, and maybe not so much in a good way was Black Widow was one of them. I I was so looking forward to her backstory. I was so looking forward to to the telling of one of my very favorite Avenger characters. And I while I enjoyed it, I didn't love it. It didn't um, it didn't make me go. I have to go and see it again. I it's like a once got it. All right. Interesting. And move on. And I hate to say that because I really, really wanted to like it. But the one that I really liked was Shang-Chi. I loved the Ten Rings. I loved being introduced to yet another um, piece of Marvel. I know that comes from the history of, of a lot of the comic books. I know there's a lot to unpack. Um, in that storyline. And I enjoyed it. I know some people didn't jump on that train, but that was definitely something that I loved. Lisa. Um, So there's only one Marvel movie that I'm interested in talking about, and I'm not going to talk about it. Exactly. I had to like work all the way around it. No point, (laughs) point, point. There were, there were several other Marvel movies this year and they just didn't do it for me. So I'll set Marvel aside for later. Um, And instead, I will mention two movies. One, Lou, I know that you love, but it won't be your movie, um, which is Luca, which was wonderful. Um, And I loved um, Encanto. I I, the first the very first time that I saw Encanto, I think I just wasn't in the right headspace or focused enough. Um, And it's I didn't connect with it quite as much. And it's also very Lin-Manuel Miranda in that you're consuming words very quickly. And maybe I needed more than one take. Um, But I have since rewatched it at home with my family and it has become an instant favorite in my household. I love it. Surface pressure is like in all of my running playlists. Um, It's just it. It's a great movie. It's a smart movie. It's visually stunning. Like there are some scenes in that movie where you're not like you. It feels like you're looking at you know, a, a video of real life, um, but leveled up a notch or 10. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, if you haven't watched Encanto, it's on Disney plus now, absolutely make the time for it. It's well worth it. Um, and the same thing for Luca, I would say. And, and Bruno has had a very, either a very good year or a very, very bad year. I'm not sure. Which. Look, we don't talk about Bruno. We don't talk <laughs> about Bruno. No, no, no. I think, uh, a film that was on the big screen and also now on Disney plus um, that I had been waiting for what felt like uh, 25 years was jungle cruise. Um, and I think, you know, I don't think it, it, it was to the level that everyone probably wanted, but with those movies, they're supposed to entertain you. I was entertained from the start to the end of it. We're already going to get another one. Um, I like that maybe that kind of influenced the updates that we got to the actual Jungle Cruise um, and to everyone who's saying, oh, Jungle Cruise, the movie wasn't that big of a hit. I encourage them to go over to Adventureland where they can wait for the Jungle Cruise for 90 minutes now because it has consistently been that since the summer. But, you know. The Rock can do no wrong in my eyes. <laughs> yeah, the Rock, the Rock sort of can do no wrong. He's like the Tom Brady of movie making. He's just like there all the time, like hit after hit. I'm happy you put that on the list because I love Jungle Cruise because I went in it in the right headspace. I'm like, I am not going to watch something that is going to be heavy and serious and thoughtful. Exactly. I, I sort of, and and I mean this respectfully and and appreciatively. Like I sort of put my brain on pause and I'm like, I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to have fun with this. And I'm going to love the fan service and the references to the attraction. I'm going to love the rock being the rock and Emily Blunt just doing what she does so well. 
I laughed like I had fun with it. The whole family could watch it. I, I loved the tributes and the details throughout. Um, so you're right. I think I think the Jungle Cruise was a a pleasantly surprising addition to my list. I, look, that being said, and again, 2020, 2021, I think we're still we're easing our way back into the movie experience. And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> excuse me, not just going to a theater and watching it that way after a year and a half of experiencing movies on our couch with our blankies and our Doritos and our bathroom and all like, wait a minute, this is all pretty good, but there is something about going to the movies, especially for some of these where, the audience reaction is so important. If you don't believe me, watch audience reactions when Captain America, you know, calls me all near for the first time. Spoiler alert. I think I think movies and I think the movie going experience, what we're learning from, I think even now in 2021, I think the movie going experience as a whole, not just from a Disney perspective, <clears throat> has to evolve. It has to change. It needs to become more experiential in order to get us off our butts and our couches and the comfort of our own homes. And it's not just about the price tag that a movie carries, but it's about the experience of being in the movies. And I know, I will only say that I know that this is important from the movie makers perspective as well like that's one of the things that they'd enjoy most was seeing that people were enjoying these movies together not just enjoying these movies individually as a family friends whatever at home um i i think overall <clears throat> the disney movie slate was there were highs and lows i think there were some hit and, hits and misses there were things that i did not necessarily personally love for one reason or another. I absolutely loved Luca. Um, I watched Luca was one of the few movies that I watched and then I watched again the next day and I laughed and I cried and I thought it was just visually beautiful. And I love the animation style. And again, like Encanto, uh, like Coco, just, the colors and the details were just, you sometimes forget that you're watching something that was drawn by a human being's hand as opposed to just something that was real. I think, Becky, to your point, I think Black Widow suffered because of, but when I say it suffered because of, it suffered because of timing. If Black Widow would have come out at when it was supposed to come out at, at a much earlier time, when there would have been some sense of gravitas in terms of what happened, we're like, we know what happens to the character. We, you sort of cared a little bit less because you knew how the story was going to end. I think it's surprising, uh, completely surprising, like just simple fun movie was Free Guy starring Deadpool, uh, Ryan Reynolds, which was <laughs> my family and I had a lot of fun with. Um like you, Lisa, I liked Encanto much, much better the second time I watched it. Um, I think where and how you watch it is very important. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say I was disappointed. I'm disappointed that I was disappointed by Eternals. Um, I think Eternals, while it belongs on the big screen because it is such an epic story, it suffered from trying to put too much into a relatively short, I think in, I think Eternals would have been better served by having a 12 part series on Disney plus where each of those characters is given their time, their story, their due in an individual episode, and then bring it all together in a final one or two series conclusion. Um, I think there was just a lot happening. It was very, very confusing. And even if you're, if you're, <clears throat> like I'm maybe like a four or five on the comic nerd scale, but if you're like, there's, there was a lot to try and process in terms of who was who and what was happening. And, and 
I did not feel, which is what these movies are supposed to do, I think, I did not feel any sort of emotional connection to any character, except maybe the valet. Um, I didn't feel any sort of highs and lows, and even watching it in the theater more than once, both theaters, there were no moments like that. There were those moments of gasping or applauding or anything like that. Um, So we'll we'll see where Eternals takes us. Um, But look, let's save the, we know where this is all leading up to. Like this last hour and 25 minutes really has just. Finally. Jeez. (laughs) Just been (laughs) leading us all up to uh, God. Spider-Man No Way Home. Um, (laughs) Good Lord. Good Lord. Spider-Man No Way Home. Um, I I talked about it um, on a couple of nation calls and last week's uh, WW Radio Live show. We talked about it a little bit. And I don't want to go too far down. I'll try and be as least spoilery as possible. But for me, who, if you look in my room, if you, you know, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan. Uh, I've been since I was a kid, um, it's a near perfect film. And I don't say that lightly. And as somebody who has loved Marvel movies and has watched every sort of iteration of Spider-Man on screen from the Daniel Hammond, 1977 to, you know, the 1967, you know, Spider-Man theme song animated series. This was such an amazing storytelling vehicle for not just Spider-Man, but for Peter Parker. Willem Dafoe deserves some type of recognition or credit for his portrayal of Green Goblin. And what I loved most about this movie, um, and I don't want to spoil it, is, you know, some people complained for Spider-Man Homecoming that we didn't get Peter Parker's origin story like we're so used to seeing we want to see this him get bitten by the spider we want to see Uncle Ben that didn't happen because we've seen it twice before and we're like well we're just gonna have to take the origin story for granted but no we don't because spider because (laughs) I get so excited Spider-Man No Way Home is the culmination of this three film origin story it is in this movie that Peter Parker wonderfully and beautifully and emotionally becomes Spider-Man and he becomes Spider-Man when he has the the loss that he suffers when he literally and I just love the subtlety of there's a moment when he literally has the blood on his hands and he has the guilt that Spider-Man Peter Parker had in the comics for Uncle Ben. He needed to go through all of these different emotional states and then at that very... Peter Parker didn't... Peter Parker didn't become Spider-Man until that final scene when he jumps out the window. And if you... Can I spoil it now? Like, has enough time gone on? Well, you've done a good enough job already, so why do you keep going? (laughs) Well, give give everyone like a... Please go on mute. When he hit, hand, when he makes by hand his own costume and he has this understanding of and they finally said the line correctly that with great power there must also come it, it doesn't just automatically come there must also come the great responsibility there is this moment that Peter Parker becomes Spider-Man I loved 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 this movie so much I laughed, I cried, I screamed. I saw it three times in three days, only beaten by my son who saw it five times in four days. Um, Is it possibly the, this is a separate conversation, but is it possibly the best, if not top two or three Marvel movies? Yeah, I think it is. I think for me, I'm a, the the type of person who even before covid the movie theater experience was getting a little old for me it it was becoming a bit tedious a bit too much of a chore going there having to interact with other human beings um other people talking in the theater having to pay for popcorn that was so expensive it was becoming less enjoyable than than sitting on my couch 
seeing that movie in a theater in Spider-Man, <clears throat> that's what it needs to become. <clears throat> that is an experience that has to be done together with other people in that thing. And I think three of us are very lucky that we get to see it at Sinopolis and that's an experience in and of <laughs> itself as well. But those sorts of things I think are what bring people back to the movies. And I'm with you, Lou. I think the movie theater experience needs to change. Um, in some ways, I don't ever see myself going to a comedy or a rom-com in a movie theater anymore. I don't think it, it needs to be done for me personally, but seeing that movie in a movie theater was so important. And I don't know if it would have had the same impact if it came out just on Disney plus. Oh yeah. For, for me, um, my, my true confession that I've already made to you guys is that no, I haven't seen Luca. I haven't seen Encanto. I haven't seen the internals, but I was, I know I'll, I'll catch up. I, I promise. I promise I'll catch up. But on opening day, I was in a theater for Spider-Man because I'm, I'm with you, Connor. I'm, there's, there's some movies that my my big screen TV at home is just fine and I can wait for it to come out on streaming or I can buy the streaming, whatever I need to do there. But this particular movie, it had to be on a big screen. It had to be with Dolly Sound. It had to have all of that impact that you get in a theater. And I I will agree. It's up there in the top three, maybe five. I'd have to really think through all of that. But I really enjoyed the storytelling of this movie and how it was presented and how I, I didn't read anything. I didn't look on IMDb to see who was going to be cast in it. I didn't want to know anything. So I went in with no expectation except for knowing it's going to be a great story because it's Spider-Man and Tom Holland, which I adore Tom Holland. And to have the surprises that came out of nowhere for me. I didn't anticipate or expect some of the things that happened. Um, it was a, it was a wonderful roller coaster of emotions. And I loved being on that ride every single second. It's at least top two for me. And from just a pure enjoyment, pure admitted enjoyment and rewatchability factor, it's absolutely without question. Number one, it functioned on like the grand level of a Marvel movie, but also on the intimate level of like the relationships between the characters being so beautiful and so simple. Um, you absolutely got to see Peter Parker change from a boy to a man. I mean, he was, he grew up in front of our eyes in this movie. Um, it's interesting. I was, I was watching like a movie review online and they were talking about how our kids aren't going to understand what made for TV means anymore because what made for tv used to mean is very different and i think it's no longer like a signifier of like the level of the art or like the level of the experience but it's more like the quality of the film like you said like made for tv certainly doesn't mean what it used to but at the same time there's no way in heck that i am not watching spider-man no way home in a movie theater and it, it was it's interesting that you mentioned the the place where we <laughs> where we all watched it um, when I was in that theater, it was the it was like a level of energy that I haven't felt in I don't know how long, maybe Endgame. But even that wasn't quite as special because we weren't coming back from something so hard. Um, and I was in the movie theater and it wasn't just the very full movie theater that was exciting. It was like, like just the the people I almost called them cast members, but the people, the people working in the movie theater um, were so excited and like running around and busy and taking it's a it's a theater that serves food and they were all like taking the orders and like there was all this you know the the employees that were you know, buzz, buzzing about excitedly like before the movie it was there was like this level of energy and like we were at the movies like we were at the movies we weren't at the movies because we got let out of our houses we were at the movies because we wanted to be at the movies and I think it was like the very first time that I've really fully felt like that since everything shut down yeah although I'm sure that you know ahead of time, like you don't order your food during the movie. Like that's to, that is that is forbidden. You do you make sure sometimes you get a little little thirsty. No, no, you no, know, no, no, no. sit down. 
down. No, I was talking about before, <laughs> before the movie. You know, you get your, you get your full, you get your full like, glass of beverage <laughs> yeah. before the like, movie. Dad, we need to get there 45 <laughs> minutes early, order all the food in advance because I don't want anybody walking in front of me. I'm not going to have any of this going on. I said, don't worry. We've Nicholas, always a diva. <laughs> Because it's important, right? You want to, you don't want anything to spoil no, that, you know, again, that, and we keep using this word, the movie going experience, which I understand for Becky. Becky's movie going experience is usually watching from a first class seat on an airplane. So you're losing a little bit of something when you watch your movies there, Becky, but I understand. Luca on the seven inch screen is not going to be as impactful as watching it on a big screen, but that's all right. And she's on mute. Mm. You know, sometimes <laughs> I she was so angry. She was on. Mute. <laughs> yes, I was like yelling at you and I'm on mute. So I won't yell at you this time. But yeah, OK, fine. I will watch it on Disney Plus at least for you, because a play. here's the problem with with shows like Encanto and Luca. Is it somewhere in there? I'm going to cry my eyes out. I'm going to ugly cry for at least 20 or 30 minutes of the movie. And I don't want to do that on a plane because then you get people next to you who are looking at you and they think you're crazy. So I try not to do that. So I'll watch that in Disney+. You know Plus. what? I, that I'm save gonna, me? I'm going to say this to you. I'll, yeah. I will, I'll use a little Catholic Italian guilt. Oh, Mom, boy. tell me if I'm uh, doing this right. <laughs> Watching these movies for the first time on an airplane screen <laughs> is disrespectful to those that put so much effort into it. Yes, sir. I will watch it on Disney Plus on my 70-inch TV screen. Is that okay? Now you're just showing off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, move on now. That'd be great. Uh, anything else from a theatrical perspective? All right, so, I, I, and I know we said 10, possibly 12. God only knows where we are on this list. Is there anything else for you that you think bears mentioning for an important moment from Disney in 2021. Lisa, you are waving your hands wildly about the screen. I mean, there, there are a few others that I'm sure we're going to get to, but we can't not talk about the return of Run Disney, which we're, we're recording this, of course, the weekend before Marathon Weekend, but we had our first in-person Run Disney event in November, which was Wine and Dine. And like, talk about like coming full circle in this conversation because we started with talking about like different ways to experience the parks and like how it's not just all about the attractions and the run Disney events are such an important part and they're a community all their own um, that has been separated for so so long um, and being back together again for wine and dine was so special and so amazing um, and I know we're all so excited for marathon weekend um, next weekend it was also on my list um Obviously not because I'm a runner uh, or because we have a running team or because, you know, of, or the experience, the fun experience we have of going out and, and cheering all the runners. But it is, it, it's a significant and important milestone in terms of the returning to quote unquote normalcy. And for a lot of people, that is and continues to be their entry point into the Disney experience. And it's important for so many people not because of the miles, not because of the medals, but but all those other things that the Run Disney races represent. And honestly, Lisa, it was very, very high on my list of of things that I wanted to to include. So I'm happy you mentioned it. Good. That being said, Becky and I are going to be so unhappy getting up at two o'clock in the morning to cheer <laughs> in a couple of days. But I'm looking so forward to it. It is all. I'm working. not looking forward to my. We missed either, it, but it'll all be worth it once we we're did. awake and. I got a cramp in my leg when you guys were talking about that. (laughs) Missed it so much last year. And I'm, I'm actually looking forward to the 2 a.m. alarm. Now ask me the day after that. And I might somewhat change the story, but um, I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody out on the course again. I'm going to live stream me picking up Becky at two o'clock in the morning. So you get the full (laughs) unadulterated, unedited, uncensored version. Don't talk to me. Do not talk to me until I have my coffee and my Egg McMuffin. And then we're good. (laughs) After the Egg McMuffin, everything is fine. But before the Egg McMuffin, you're taking your chances. Yeah. Well, know that those first 25 miles are much different knowing you guys are waiting. So it's worth it when that alarm goes off. So thank you. 
Uh, Becky, Connor, anything else? Yes. You want to add? Whoa. You're missing something that was extraordinarily important. I, I have more things on my list. I'm giving you the courtesy of going next. Don't yell at okay. me. Okay. <laughs> it's been so long. We There's a lot of, of catch up that you and I need to do. I'm so looking forward to the next two weeks. Two whole weeks. Um, the return to cruising. Yeah. Disney Cruise Line getting back in the water again and taking guests on board and being able to return to the cruise experience. Um, that was one of the things that I, I had been on several of the cruise lines because I wanted to experience the protocols. I wanted to be able to talk about uh, the safety. And, and quite honestly, this is a great week to talk about this because um, the cruise experience is actually extremely safe if you pick the right lines with the right protocols and of course disney does it wonderfully um it was one of the best experiences that we had you and i went on our first cruise since the um since the pandemic hit it felt so wonderful to return to the port and to be able to get on the ship and to see the cast members again and to have a cruise experience and still be able to uh, to be socially distanced and to uh, to do it safely. And I really did. It, it warmed my heart very much to be able to get back to cruising because I know that that was something that was missed by so many. And when you walk on board, the cast members, I think that they were happier that we were there than than we were there. You know, they were so warm and um I, I saw several of them cry when they saw people on board and it was it was just very moving and very touching and I'm glad that that the cruise industry has been able to figure out how to deliver the experience but still keep it safe. And while you have the CDC that has um its own opinions it's the only industry that the CDC is actually coming down on uh, out of all the travel experiences that are out there. And quite frankly, even before this, I felt safer and do still feel safer on a cruise than I do in a shopping mall or honestly, sometimes at a theme park or in any of these public locations, because I know when I get on board, everyone's been tested. Most people in most cases are vaccinated because there's still the children who are, are not able to be vaccinated. But if you are 12 and up, and in some cases like Disney starting in January, five and up, uh, you have to be vaccinated to get on board. So I know that everyone has been vaccinated, everyone's been tested, and you're in a controlled environment with protocols and everyone is wearing masks. So it is, um, it's very I don't know. I'm I'm just so excited to be able to return to that experience. And again, when we walked on board for the very first time, it, it really did finally feel like we were crawling our way out of this tunnel that we've been in the past two years. And actually, if you go back to show 649, um, we recap and review our cruise on the Disney Dream when it opened uh, post COVID, including what's new and what's different and what to expect and everything you need to know ahead of time. Again, that show 649. Um, and I, by the way, I agree with everything you said and cannot wait to get back on board in, yay, in a just month, a few weeks, just a few weeks. I know. Um, yay. Connor, anything else for you? I think it's important to acknowledge an individual who spent 47 years with the company um, whose last day was just a few days ago, a man named Bob Iger. I think um, regardless of, of wherever the company is going, if we look at the company today, right, it would be very, 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 very different if Mr. Iger wasn't at the helm and, and all of his contributions that he made to ABC and Disney over his 47 year career. I mean, half of Hollywood studios wouldn't be there if Bob Iger didn't exist, you know? And I think um, from not just a parks perspective or a, uh, a, a mergers and acquisitions perspective, because he did quite a lot of that and, and led the, the, the charge on all that um, from a, I guess you could say uh, a corporate, mindset um 
him leading the charge on technology and, and saying that it's so crucial, got us things like my Disney experience and more importantly, probably Disney plus um, very important during the pandemic, obviously. Um, but I think he laid the foundation for so much uh, and, and made certain things such a priority that the company is where it is today. Um, very, very strong because of that. And I think we have so many unique experiences in the parks and on the screens um, because of, of what he was able to do. So important. Connor Brown, of all the intelligent things that you said tonight, this I think stands out. I, because I had at the, at the very top of my list, two words, and it was Bob Iger. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree with you a thousand percent. My love of Bob goes wide and long and deep and, he will get the the recognition and the time that he is due on a full episode uh, about him and just what he has meant to this company because a lot of what we talked about tonight would not have been part of the conversation had it not, and I understand it's Bob and those around him, but if not for, for Bob Iger um, and his legacy um, as it as we start to sort of being able to look at it from hindsight, from the aforementioned mergers and acquisitions and growth, um, the fan experience that that he helped um, sort of put to um, a place of importance, um, you know, during his time with the company and community aspect of it as well. Um, I don't want to go down this road too deep, but I agree with you a hundred thousand percent. And I think, and I have, I'm going to say it again. I think what he did around the time of the pandemic when Bob Chapek took over by not saying, Hey, here's the keys, man. Good luck. (laughs) I'm peacing out. The fact that he was like, you know what? I'm going to stay here. I will be in the background. I will be behind you and I will not leave you alone to what at the time could have very much appeared like a sinking ship. I think speaks volumes about not just the businessman, but the man himself. Yeah, there's absolutely no understating his impact on the current state of the company in all of the best possible ways. Um, hopefully everybody has read his book and it was amazing to get all the behind the scenes, but high up on all of our lists. <clears throat> okay, so is there anything else that we missed? This is the catch-all, very quick lightning additions to things that maybe did not make it onto the list, but you think... Bear mentioning. I mean, in that vein, too, I think it bears mentioning, even if we probably won't know the repercussions for many years, that the Parks Experiences and Consumer Products Division has been moved to to Florida. Um, and um, I think it's going to be interesting to see kind of what shakes out from that, kind of what what happens with the energy of the company, with things kind of shifting um, in this direction, what happens with the property um, out in California. Um a lot of unknowns, um, but a whole, whole lot of positions were relocated. And I think that probably bears mentioning. So it was on my list. Um, the fact that Walt Disney Imagineering is moving to Lake Nona, which is just about 40 minutes or so north of Walt Disney World and the relocation of 2000 jobs. <clears throat> this conversation has obviously two sides to the coin and one of which very much involves people, some of which I'm sure we and I know I know personally because this decision and the decision that was that was oftentimes put in front of these imagineers and their families is very challenging and very very difficult um and in some cases was not practical uh, and forced them to un- you know fortunately unfortunately have to move on to a, a next and different chapter in their lives I-, I agree that when it does come here Um, that it's not only going to add jobs and provide new opportunities for here in Central Florida, but what I have to imagine is going to be an amazing state-of-the-art technical campus and facility. If you've ever been to Imagineering, uh, whether it's through an adventure bit by Disney, um, you know, when Imagineering moved to where it is currently on Flower Street back in the, the 60s, it was an old studio girls cosmetic facility and they eventually took over literally like a bowling alley next door. The facilities in which Imagineering is in the building they are in 
is not a very modern, high tech, you know, Apple Google campus as you would expect it to be. The facility has history and there's there's Walt in those walls and so many of the legends of Imagineering, but the facility itself is old. I mean, it's an old, it's a building from the fifties, maybe even um, the forties, the, the, the cosmetic facility that, that was the, and they are still going to have, they're going to keep that, that location and still keep jobs out there. But I think what the long-term future also might mean for how this might impact us as guests, us as um, potential attendees to experiences might also be very different too. Look, I want to also mention like events came back. Destination D23 came back here in Walt Disney World. As we look to things like D23 Expo in 2022 in in just a few months, uh, now with Imagineering moving a lot of their facilities out here, you wonder how that might potentially impact not just the Imagineers and their families, but what but whether opportunities may come out here for guests as well. I can see the two sides of the coin on this one, though, because honestly, my heart breaks for the cast members who have invested so much of their lives and their time uh, to be in Imagineering or to to pursue those those positions and those careers. And some some of their family um, experiences aren't going to allow them to move. And for them, it's a tough choice. And, you know, to to be a cast member at Disney means more than just having a job there. So many people are there and take those positions because they love the company. They love the legacy. They love everything it, it means to be a part of, of the Disney legacy. And so, you know, I, I see the opportunity. I know that there's great benefits to moving it, but I can't stop but think about the people who are unable to pursue those opportunities for one reason or another, and to not have um, all of that going on under the same roof that had all of that legacy and all that history. That could be a positive and a negative, because like you said, the facilities are older. So this does offer a great opportunity, but I, I have a mixed very mixed feelings about it. No, it's it's why I led with the most important part, which is the people. Um, yeah. Those that, you know, we don't know and some that we do. And I know ones individually that, that had to make that very difficult choice and say, Me too. I can't move my family and yeah. I have to leave this thing that I love and is so important to me. You know, and there's a, there's a part of me that in the back of my mind hopes that as time goes on and things evolve, maybe those opportunities open up again where they are in California. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't have any knowledge of of what the long and, and short term plans are, but um, you know, hoping that that those who choose and are able to and want to go back to this place and this family and the career that they love so much are are able to do so because we know how much it means to them. Yeah. So uh anything else? Any other last Thoughts, additions, important moments from 2021. R.I.P. Disney legend Betty White. God rest her soul. <laughs> Poor Betty White. I know that. But how you know, is that even Betty possible? White, it, can I tell you something? Betty White <sighs> pulled the most Betty White move in the world because she's like, oh, all of you magazines that are putting out magazines about <laughs> Betty White's hundredth birthday, I'm going to show you. Boom, and That's... then she's out like days before. Um, Fair I enough. Think, I literally think that's Betty White having the most wonderful last laugh. <laughs> Point taken. Yeah, you're probably right. All right. So quick lightning round. And Becky, lightning round means fast. Ah, First thing I that have comes like to your mind. What's the one word to describe Disney in 2021? Roller coaster. Lisa. In 2021? Oh, sorry. I thought, I thought you meant like the actual roller coaster. I'm like, there's one coming in 2022. No, 2021. <laughs> I, I had should to amend been, my name or my, my word. In 2021, but. Um, I'll say change. And I think that this is a great example of how we framed this whole conversation because you can think about what you've lost or you can think about what's new in return. You know, you can think about losing the wave or you can think about getting Steakhouse 71. You can think about losing fast passes or you can talk about getting Genie and Genie Plus. And so, you know, it's on how you frame it and how you choose to think about it. Um, and so I'm not going to think about the things 
I, I, I will honor the things that I lost, but I will focus on the changes that we got instead. Dare I say, choosing the good. Connor Brown, right. one word. It's it's two words, and I already talked about it, but October 1st. Okay. I don't know. It just sticks out to me the most. Uh, my my word is optimism. My word for 2021 was optimism. Becky, what is the best of the best of the best from Disney in 2021? One thing. What? <laughs> in 20, I thought you were gonna like go into 2022 for me now because I need to look ahead um, instead of looking back because the the best of the best of the best for 2021. I'm, I got to go. The first thing I mentioned was Adventures Campus because it was something new, something original, something looking forward, something that was part story, something that was immersive. Everything that we know and love Disney for is in that land in one place. And I, I really do think that the opening of that land gave me the hope that I was looking for for 2021 after, you know, going through what we did for 2020. Lisa. Velocicoaster. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hey, that was a pretty good coaster, oh, though. Yeah, you got to admit. Also, <laughs> no, um, I having will, technical it, issues. <laughs> the, 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 I'm kidding. The, no, the, the best of the best of the best of Disney in 2021 was its community. Because anything else that went wrong, the community fixed it. Whether even, it was, even when it lit itself on fire. <laughs> <laughs> too soon. <laughs> <laughs> But truly, like, you know, nothing mattered on October 1st, but being together with our people, seeing the cast of Festival of the Lion King come together and feeling their joy, being with Yeehaw Bob, like just the, the Disney community in 2021, I think, showed us all that really nothing else matters. Connor Brown? I don't, I mean, there's something, it, it sounds so little and insignificant, but... The speaking of magic on Spaceship Earth, I don't know what it is, but I feel like of everything this year, that's the thing that I keep looking at and I can continue to look at it and feel the most visceral reaction to it. And it's just lights, you know? But I think what it symbolizes and what that attraction has always symbolized and how they added to it and made it you know, a, a, a focal point of that park at nighttime, I think is just so, so freaking awesome. What I find interesting about that though, I want to just interject is that the only one out of the four that anybody talks about is the one at Epcot. So I have a, a thing to say about that as well. And this is another, and I, I can't believe I'm saying it again, where we have to remove ourselves as Disney fans because I think all the beacons of magic are very cool, but to a certain extent, We've seen the Cinderella Castle projection before. We've seen the a projection on Tower of Terror. We've seen Tree of Life awakens their projection sort of so. So someone who comes in who's never seen any of that is going to be blown away right. by all four of them. For us, we'd never seen anything on Spaceship Earth like that. And the impact and importance of Spaceship Earth is so important to all of us. So I think that's why people continue to put it at the top of their list. And it's not that they don't talk about the other ones i think it's just this is just so much more significant in a lot of ways and it's very it's impactful also a brand new toy for them to play with i mean exactly for many 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 years to come whether yeah. it's turning it into you know something for the holidays or you know <laughs> something for an, an ip you know there are so many things that can be done with those lights and you know like connor said the projections are they're lovely but they're just different pictures on the mm -hmm. same things that we've seen laser projections on many, many times before. Spoiler alert. It's the answer to my next lightning round question, but my answer to this one, and I tried to keep it one word again, was people. Um, it was people. And it was everything that we talked about from cast members to Imagineers to entertainers to Tom Holland and Peter Parker and Norman Osborn and all the other people that made this year what it was. Uh, my answer, which is beacon of magic is what is the best new addition specifically to the parks? Rebecca? Individual lightning lane a la carte one time only purchase access for now. I don't know. Oh, I thought you were being serious. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's not a bad answer, actually, for, again, the people who are not living in the backyard of it and who only get to visit every few years. So that's not a bad answer. The funky chicken at Everglazed, also a good answer. Haven't had it yet. Just somebody hasn't taken me. You said that you would take me to have that forever ago. And Becky, you know. I told you there's no concierge lounge at Everglades. So you're <laughs> going to have to just resolve this sort of impasse. So I'll actually say this, which was another October 1st thing for on-site resort hotel guests. 30 minutes early every single day to every park. At the beginning, people are like, well, that's not very special. But when you think about it and you start you know, strategizing around it and planning around it, you get a jump on everyone every single day to get to that one big attraction. And I think that that's, that's really huge. It's a really big perk that kind of get gets access to the genie stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. Would like to see 60 though. <laughs> 60 minutes. Yeah. Oh, it, it was delightful the last two weeks when they upped it. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Lisa? I mean, I'd love to say something brand new and be unique, but of the truly, truly new things to the parks and Spaceship Earth, a thousand percent with the pylons in front and everything. It's like it's everything that they didn't do a hundred percent in my own, own humble opinion, perfectly elsewhere. Spaceship Earth is like it's fully honoring what was there. The pylons that went up are are historic um, you know, the flags that went up with all the old symbols and the monorail going by lit up now. Lit, I mean, it's, right, it's just, lit up. Yeah. I forgot about that. That's really the, like, cool. Monoliths with the pictures. They, they put them elsewhere in full Yay. color. So they were, you know, they, they're still <laughs> there and they look even better than they did before. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel like spaceship earth was like, whoever was in charge of that one got it, got it just right. Yeah. Um, Best idea ever to move those those monoliths. I, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. Everything was done right. Everything was done right. What is your, this is your second to last one. What is your best, keep the story short, what is your best personal Disney memory from 2021? <laughs> wow. For me, it was returning to the parks. It, it was um, just walking back in the gates again because it, it had opened up way before for you guys. Uh, and I wasn't able to get there till 2021. And the same for Disneyland. Just not realizing how impactful um, being in a theme park is, you know, um, having been locked in my house and dealing with uh, the impact of COVID on my family and on my business and on me. And, um, you know, frankly, from last year that I shared, I had a bout of breast cancer and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it at, at some points in my brain. So to ever, or to walk back into a place that I love with the people that I love, um, that that's, that's it. That's the, that's the whole thing for me. Um, for me, it was watching the very last um, Happily Ever After with my kids. Um, when we found out that the last showing was going to be the 29th, we got our passes. They actually had dentist appointments for after school that day, which I canceled. <laughs> um, we went to the store. We got food. We left immediately after school. We set up camp right on the hub in the perfect spot. I set up my camera. The kids sat on the ground and ate their food. Um and when the time came, we just stood together and we watched the show. And um, it's my my older son really, really connected with it, with that with that particular show. And he cried, um, just stood there and hugged him afterwards. And um, you know, we had a lot of hope for what was what was coming next at that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, just just sort of closing that chapter with my kids and kind of thinking about what happily ever after meant to us as a family and kind of thinking about what the next show was going to mean to us as locals. Um, definitely, definitely our, our top moment for the year. Yeah. I had a lot of cool moments this year too. A lot of cool changes as well for me personally, as it revolves around the parks as well. But I think the one thing, one story in particular took place one day before Lisa's, which was, the, the second to last day of Happily Ever After. And 
I'm standing there and I'm I'm watching it and it and it's great and I loved it. Um, and then it ends and and I turn and I notice there's a cast member there and she was selling balloons before the the show. Show ends and I turn and I see her and she's just sobbing, crying profusely, you know. And we make eye contact and she just kind of throws her hands in the air like, "What are you gonna do?" And I was just like. I said uh, something like, oh, it's too good. It was too good, you know? And for me, that resonated with me so much because um, I remember when I was a cast member on my college program, we all got together when our program was done and on our last night, we saw wishes. And we're all standing there as fellow cast members, um, you know, getting very, very emotional. and to see that that cast member was was so emotional about that show um, and knowing that she wasn't emotional because of the show itself, but because of everything that happened to her and her memories she had during the time that that show existed. And I just felt very connected to this total stranger in that moment. Um, and even now I kind of get chills and goosebumps um, about it, but I think everyone who listens to this show understands that these aren't just theme parks. These aren't just shows. These aren't just attractions for us. It's something intangible that we can't quite put our finger on, but we know it when we see it. And it's, it's so important to all of us. Um, and when things come and go just like that, we have those emotional connections. And, and I think it's pretty cool that we get to share it even with strangers out there in the world. I'm so glad you mentioned that because when I was just telling the story about the last happily ever after, I was focusing more on my kids because that was what was on my mind in the moment. But it's so true. Like what I was talking about community before, like that was such a big part of that last, those last two shows, the last show too. Um, just the, 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 the hub just shoulder to shoulder full yeah. of people belting out the words of happily <laughs> ever after in unison weeping. Like it was just the most beautiful show of love for this thing that we all were saying goodbye to together. Um, thank you for, for reminding me of that. Seeing that yeah, and as you, amazing. as both of you were talking about that it reminds me of the night on the, September 30th, when they did the dedication for October 1st and it was, a lot of cast members, this, a ton of cast members were in there and watching the fireworks for the very first time in so long and watching them embrace and cry. And um, I, I witnessed a lot of really special moments, very intimate moments between people who were um, mourning what they've been through, but yet celebrating that it, it was moving forward, that, uh, fireworks were back and the parks are coming back and people are coming back. Their jobs are coming back. Um, that, that was really impactful. I'll only share a very, very brief story and it's probably going to come as no surprise. Um, and it was one of those, there was like two aspects of it because especially those of us who are locals or who are, are fortunate and, and blessed to, to come often we we have this sometimes inability to experience new things for the first time because we're here. So like our theme park going experience, while it's always fun and enjoyable and there's there's always sort of magic in it for me, when we get to experience something new for the very first time that that we fall in love with, even to a lot of your points, um, it's how I felt when I walked into Avengers Campus. Um, and even more so, so Becky and I went for a couple of days to, to to cover it and share it and sort of do work as it were. And then when my family was able to get there a couple of days later and I was able to... <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. When I was able to watch their faces when I was able to watch my kids' faces as they walked in and saw the land and heard the music and the Easter eggs and Spider-Man and the characters, I hadn't been able to have that experience since when they were really young 
in Walt Disney World and as new attractions and stuff open and there was this incredible transformative and I know they're children but they're not children like this childlike wonderment and awe in their eyes and I'm like this is it like this is what it's all about like watching their reaction was almost as good as when I met Spider-Man. No, I mean, it was better than when I met <laughs> Spider-Man for the first time, but they're it, they're very, very close. Um, but to be able to have that moment and watching their faces and my kids not wanting to leave, like they just wanted to stay and just want to be part of it, mm-hmm. that day, that moment in, in Avengers Campus, um, I'll remember for a long, long time. That was very cool. And you're right. That's one thing that we don't get to do a lot anymore is having that that first experience of something. And it, that's that's a, amazing. Which will lead me into the final question, because there's a very there could be a very quick and easy answer for this. What are you looking forward to most from Disney in 2022? Rapid fire. First. You yeah. can make me go first again. Okay. Well, I got three, four. No, you have one. No, have one. no, I don't get Most. one. I get more than one. No, you don't. It's... Because they're all at the same level. So just one. Work Pick with me. One. Go with me. No. <laughs> Disney Wish. Yeah. Star Cruiser. And I'm hoping to see more SEA. There's a lot of teases going on that there's going to be some more SEA magical things happening, and I'm looking forward to that. I'll throw in the new Magic Band for the fun of it. Hmm. And um, yeah, because I, w- I want to see the new Magic Band. I don't know why it looks intriguing. It looks fun. Um, but of course, also the the movies coming back between Doctor Strange and of course, Thor. Thor's coming back. That's going to make me don't make very it happy. Don't make it <laughs> and, uh, and then um, Black Panther this 2. Like I'm also looking like forward to that. Yeah. I know. You said three. I'm going through. I know. I'm, I'm now you're on 19. Fine. I was done with mine. <laughs> Disney Wish. Pretty sure there's going to be another show about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm sure I'm forgetting things I'll remember later. But we recently found out that we were getting two things back that I'm very excited about for pure nostalgic purposes and it's festival of fantasy and phantasmic um and god forgive me for every time i walked out of hollywood studios and with no interest in phantasmic um because i will be there on opening day with tears streaming down my face to hear that music again um and festival of fantasy even more so like for me that was sort of when we used to come here on vacation and first walked into magic kingdom on that first day and saw festival of fantasy that was my like i'm a I'm at Disney World moment. Like it's just, it's so colorful and beautiful and the music is incredible. And I just love everything about it. And I'm so happy that we're getting some parade back in some form. I love the cavalcades and I think they're great for all their own reasons, but there's just something about a Disney parade and I'm happy we're getting it back. Mine's, you know, Epcot related. Um, There's a lot coming, but I think, I'm more excited, not so much about what's going to be opening, but what's going to become becoming down, which I want more of the walls to be coming down because <laughs> it is a nightmare in that park right now. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would agree with me in that. And of course, when those walls come down, we will get cool things like Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. We're going to get the Moana thing. We're going to get the dreamers point. I think that's what they're calling it. The, the Walt statue. Um, all of those things are going to be very, very, very cool. But I think it's more Epcot, just kind of um, Epcot getting her groove back, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I want you to take note of one thing. There was, if memory serves, there was like zero discussion of food in this show, which Maybe a first for WW Radio. So in 2022, <laughs> I'm looking for more conversations about food. We need to sort of catch up. No, um, oh, farts, baby. Festival of the Arts. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Coming back. <laughs> uh, only the second show I ever had to edit. Um, oh, sorry. I am, so I, I say this every year because it's true. I, I always say that I'm looking forward to the things that we don't know about. And I think, mm. I really do think there's going to be a lot oh. this year for a variety of reasons. That being said, I am looking forward 
very, very much so to the Disney wish. I love the cruise experience. I'm looking forward to seeing where uh, Disney Cruise Line and Imagineering are going to take this experience, including the Marvel-themed restaurant. Um, And I'm also, in addition to looking forward to the things that I and we don't know about yet, I'm also looking forward to sharing the things that you don't know about yet. It's so scary to me. Yeah. That completely terrifies me on As so many levels. I look up levels. at the whiteboard and I <sighs> quietly chuckle about the things that I have not shared publicly or that I haven't shared with Becky as yet. Yeah. Um, there's a lot that I have I have planned and I have been quietly working on in the background for 2022. Um, that coming full circle, I, I really look forward to sharing with and experiencing with and giving to and and uh, doing for and with the community because without that and without you, you, our friend who's been sitting around this table um, sharing this experience with us would not happen. Um, you have been the best part of 2021 and this entire, in just a few weeks, celebrating the 17-year journey that is uh, WDW Radio. So... That is what I am most grateful for and thankful for and and looking forward to in this coming year. As I am always thankful for each and every one of you, Becky Mankin from Mouse Fan Travel, Lisa Donato Glasser from the Castle Run and Core Memory Candles, and Connor Brown from WW Opinion, all of whose links I will put in this week's show notes. Uh, Thank you very much for joining me tonight, as well as all the adventures we had last year and in the years to come. I thought of one more. Looking for looking forward to D23 Expo. We get to go and enjoy all of that. And you were saying about things looking forward. Yeah, we get to see everybody. We get to be part of the community again. And we get to hear what we get to talk about next time, what we're looking forward to, because they'll make all those great announcements. And we'll get excited, right? Concerts are coming back to the festivals, too. So hopefully Baja men make their triumphant return. <laughs> Song go? Who let the dogs out? I'm sorry, who? I, I'm who? Not familiar with the, with the theme. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sing it! I'm looking forward to Connor singing on the show in 2022. Yeah. <laughs> you know, anything's possible. Thank you guys again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you could eat at any one Walt Disney World restaurant right this very minute, where would we go? Steakhouse 71. Oh, uh, um, um, it's open. <laughs> <laughs> the corn dog cart. I want a corn dog and a chimichanga, a chimichanga and a corn dog. Which one Disney, would you do it first? Disneyland chimichanga all the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I could uh, destroy a couple cattails, Cheshire cattails right now. <laughs> I could take I down sweet. some Sanab bread service all oh. by my lonesome. I'll take a grandma Every day slushy. Of the week. Oh yeah. I haven't had a grandma knee slushy in a while. There was somebody doing that. I thought no. I had a better chance if I said Steakhouse 71 because I took <laughs> Time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or the details that you see, hear, remember, or taste. If you think you know the answer, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is once again brought to you by you. And what I mean by that is that as part of the WW Radio Nation family, you literally help bring every episode of WW Radio to life, every live broadcast, the contests and giveaways, They're all thanks to and because of and for you. And you can find out how you can help the show for as little as a dollar per month and get cool exclusive rewards every month like scavenger hunts, trivia quests, group video calls. We have a private Facebook group, shirts, stickers, monthly care packages, early access and discounts to special events and much more. And don't forget that a portion of your contribution goes to our Dream Team project to benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. You can find out more and join the nation by going to www.radio.com support. Now, before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, I asked you to tell me on what two 
Walt Disney World attractions can you find a man in a bathtub? And no, I wasn't kidding. You serious, Clark? No, I wasn't kidding. And thanks to all of you who entered, got this one correct. And know that the two attractions are Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress, Uncle Orville, no privacy at all around this place, and Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And as you're going through the tiny town of Tumbleweed, which was dried out, but now is flooding, if you look across as you pass the dry goods store on your left, there's a man in a bathtub in a full red onesie surrounded by chickens just basking in the Florida sun. So anyway, I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and last week you were playing for a WW Radio pin and keychain and bonus mystery prize, all of which, by the way, are only available as contest prizes. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is... Carrie Joplin. So, Carrie, congratulations. I will get your prize package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So, as long as we're talking about the screens and Marvel, tell me, what Marvel character made his or her live debut in Walt Disney World as a walk-around character in 2016. What character made his or her live debut in a Walt Disney World Park as a walk-around character in 2016? You have until Sunday, January 16th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there. Once again, you're going to play for the pin, the keychain, and maybe I'll even throw in, throw in a bonus Marvel mystery prize. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. I'd love to hear from you and your thoughts on your favorite or most important movie or Disney Plus show from 2021. Come be part of the community and conversation. Talk about not just this week's show, but anything in the Disney, Marvel, and Star Wars universes over at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. You can also connect with me on social. I'm at Lou Mangiello on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Also be sure to like the WW Radio page on Facebook at facebook.com slash WW Radio and turn on notifications so you don't miss a thing, including our Wednesday night live shows every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern at www.radiolive.com. You can also email me, lou at www.radio.com if you have a question that you'd like me to answer on the show or call the voicemail be heard on the air with a question, a comment, or just a hello from the parks at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-9391. 900 WDW1. Want to say special thanks to some new and longtime members of the WW Radio Nation family. I am so grateful for the support and the help and the friendship that you give to me and the show, and I love being able to give back to you each and every month. I want to thank Tony Irvin, Tom Nolan, Marnie Romando, Angie Robinson, and Debbie Hartlett for being part of the Nation family. Again, go to wwradio.com slash support to find out more and join for as little as a dollar a month. And again, as much as I love connecting with you online, nothing beats a handshake and a hug and getting to see you in person. Thanks to everybody who came out to our meet of the month this past weekend over Walt Disney World Marathon weekend. And huge congratulations to not just all of the members of the WW Radio running team who did their five, ten, half, full, goofy, dopey, or just came out to cheer with us. I am so incredibly proud of all of you who participated in the event. And thanks to all the volunteers from Disney as well. Thanks to everybody who came out to the meet of the month on Saturday, not just to celebrate getting together, being there for the marathon, and we had a very, very special treat by being able to meet not just a Make-A-Wish child and her family who you helped make that wish come true by being part of the nation and the running team, but somebody from Make-A-Wish actually came out to the event because they wanted to meet and thank you themselves in person. It was an amazing magical and very obviously emotional weekend and if you want to learn more about our fundraising efforts and how you could be a part of it you can go to dreamteamproject.org 
Stay tuned for details about our next Meet of the Month in February and beyond, as well as our cruises, our Marvel Day at Sea, our two Disney Wish cruises in 2022, as well as our Fantasy Cruise in April of 2023, and upcoming events by going to www.radio.com slash events. And if there's some way that I could help you or thank you for the opportunity and the life that you have given me, I want to be able to sort of help you do the same thing, either individually or in your business, or by coming to speak to your event or your school. If you visit LouMangelo.com, you can find out about working with me one-on-one, bringing me in to speak to your business, your conference, your school, or your event, my mastermind group, upcoming events, and more. Thanks, as always, to Becky and the entire team over at MouseFanTravel.com. Wherever you are planning your next vacation, visit MouseFanTravel.com. They are my official and recommended travel provider because it's who I've used, it's who I trust, and it's why I recommend them to you for, wow, nearly almost 15 years. And finally, my friend, and you are my friend, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. How can you do that? By sharing a link to this or your favorite episode on Facebook Instagram, Twitter, whatever your favorite social is. And if you can, take just a few seconds to rate and review the show over an Apple podcast. It is incredibly helpful. I want to thank some recent reviewers like GDOM SOS, who says best podcast ever. The podcast quenches my thirst for Disney knowledge and history, but also makes me hungry for more Disney food pun intended. Thank you, GDOM SOS. And again, just search for WW Radio and Apple Podcasts or in Spotify, where you can now rate the show as well. It takes just a second. And finally, most importantly, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love and appreciate you so, so very much each day, each week, more than the last. And thank you for helping me to always remember and to find and to choose the good in everything and everyone that I encounter. And I hope that you do the same because I promise you that positivity is contagious. You'll not only feel better, but you'll make other people feel better as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love and appreciate you. If there's ever anything I could do for you, please reach out to me. Let me know. I hope to see you in the clubhouse on Facebook Wednesday night on the live show and right back here again next week. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lou. It's Giannis from Bakersfield, California. And it's Jaden. And it is now almost 2 o'clock in the morning, and we just got done watching Spider-Man. No way home. And there's no way I could understand or wrap my brain around everything that's going on right now. I have all the questions, and I need the answers. Which is crazy, man. Like, Sony, Disney, Mashup, Venom's coming. I don't know. Oh, my spoilers. We need to know, Lou. Lou, we need a Spider-Man X. Explanation story coming up pretty soon here. But anyways, again, thank you for everything that you do, Lou. And uh, we're hoping that you can help us out here. Yeah. And now I'm going to go to sleep because it's very late. But that was an amazing movie. Yeah. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Have a good night. Yeah. Bye-bye. Hello, Lou Mangiello. It's Darlene Nagy, formerly of West Seneca, New York. And I'm calling in with the fact that tomorrow – starts the WDW radio running team at the Walt Disney World Marathon. And I'm so excited for all of our running team. I wish them all the luck in the world. Then we have a 30-day WDW radio Marvel Cruise Countdown, 30 days, woohoo! And we can start checking in. It's so exciting. Then we have the ADD WDW Radio to Italy in 61 days and the WDW Radio Disney Wish Cruise in 165 days. So exciting for all these upcoming events that we're going to be able to go on. And I hope you all have a magical day. Love and hugs. Stay positive and stay safe. Sparky, too.